Everything's all right in my father's house. In my father's house. In my father's house. Everything's all right in my father's house. There is joy, joy, joy. Jesus is the way to my father's house. To my father's house. To my father's house. Jesus is the way to my Father's house. There is joy, joy, joy. Come and go with me to my Father's house. To my Father's house. To my Father's house. Come and go with me to my Father's house. There is joy, joy. Joy. We will go with you to our Father's house, to our Father's house, to our Father's house. We will go with you to our Father's house. There is joy, joy. Thank you so much, shall we pray. Dear Lord, just make me a nail upon the wall to hold your picture in its place, and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. This, our study, is Then Everything Went Wrong, cross-examined in heaven's court. In the last study, you noticed how we presented that we are witnesses from all through the Bible, from Isaiah, the gospel prophet, through to the end of the New Testament. We are witnesses, witnesses of the Lord. Now, we give our direct testimony. We praise the Lord before others. We tell men and women how good the Lord is. We render our plaudits of praise to his name. But we forget that after the direct testimony, someone has the right to cross-examine. We're not merely witnesses in this world, for we're told in Isaiah 43, 10, you're my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. But we're also told in 1 Corinthians 4, 9, that we're a spectacle to men and to angels. In Ephesians, the third chapter, it says we are witnesses to principalities and to powers in heavenly places. So as we witness to unfallen beings of the grace and the mercy and the long-suffering and the goodness of God, Satan, who claims that everyone does what he does for God only on the principle of selfishness, he says, as he did about Job, Lord, he said, listen, you let me cross-examine that man. You let me bring him trouble, and he will change his testimony. He will no longer be praising you and rejoicing. He'll curse you to your face. You remember the story. At first, the Lord said, you may try, but don't touch him. And you remember, Job lost everything. And he said, the Lord has given, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the Bible says, in all of this, Job did not transgress with his lips. Satan did not persuade Job to change his testimony. Even when he was covered with, with sores and boils and wounds and his friends came, he kind of gave them the works, but not God. Satan is doing the same in every Christian life. Satan says nobody serves God from the angle of unselfishness. He said they only are serving God for what they can get out of him. And we have noticed particularly as we teach men and women how to claim Bible promises and get fabulous results, Satan is on edge. And if you really want to have some trouble, dedicate yourself completely and unselfishly to God, and Satan will say, give me my day in court. 
after we'd had the fabulous answers that we shared with you in the last study, that $6,000 answer to prayer came so beautifully, and many, many other wonderful answers. Satan zeroed in, and everything seemed to go wrong. Financial defeat, almost financial disaster. Physical defeat, almost physical disaster. Nervous frustration. Ecclesiastical trouble. In overnight, it seemed to take place. And then my wife and I said, well, let's go for a little vacation. Things are pretty rough. So we decided we'd go down to Florida for a couple weeks. But you know the trouble in going for vacation. <laughs> you take your problems with you when the problem is yourself. <laughs> so I took Glenn Kuhn with me all the way from New York State to Florida. And I did a little crabbing. I didn't shake my fist at God. I never once said, God, why are you so mean to me? But I blamed circumstances. And I didn't realize that in blaming circumstances, we are virtually changing our testimony. As we decided finally after two weeks to return back to our home in New York State, every day that I was driving without my really being conscious of it, I was crabbing. <laughs> As I've looked back on it, I've said, you know, it's bad enough to be a coon without being a crab. I crabbed intensely as we traveled along all day. Went to bed that night, got up the next day, traveled again the second day, crabbing all day. Why did this happen to me? Whom have I murdered? From whom have I stolen anything? What have I done that this should happen to me? I'd completely forgotten that Satan demands his right in court. The third day I did the same. By this time we'd arrived at Mount Vernon, Ohio, at an academy there. They graciously gave us a guest room. We retired. The next morning, I couldn't get out of bed. Dear old Dr. Miller, China doctor, soybean specialist, goiter specialist, was a friend of ours. I said to my wife, I can't get out of bed. I wasn't paralyzed, but I couldn't move. I said, will you call Dr. Miller? Dear old Dr. Miller came over, looked me all over. After the second look, he said, uh, nerve exhaustion, six months for you. Well, if you know anything about the Kuhn family, you know that could be about the worst thing that could happen. We like to be on the wiggle all the while. From the time I was born till now, I'm a wiggler. Six months in bed for me? I can't bear the thought. And then I remembered I had been crabbing. I had virtually been changing my testimony. I had forgotten that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to those who are the call according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. I had forgotten Romans, Romans 8, 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. He who gave Jesus to die on Calvary for you, Glenn Coon, he hasn't forgotten you. It's just Satan's day in court. And then the Holy Spirit flashed into my mind a text that I hadn't thought of for a long while, Galatians 6, 7. It says this, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And the Holy Spirit said, You have been sowing a lot of negatives, Glenn Coon, and you're only reaping what you've sown. And then, praise the Lord, the Holy Spirit gave me hope in that very text. It, it was flashed into my mind by the same token. Since you have intensely crabbed for three days and now you are completely exhausted, I couldn't even move to the next room, if you will praise God and change your testimony in a joyful praise and thank the Lord in spite of all the trouble, in three days you can get up and go home. I said, oh, praise the Lord. I didn't say it. I couldn't say it. I was, I was too exhausted to say it. I thought it. And then I remembered a medical doctor back in my home church had been teaching his patients to praise the Lord. There are 826 texts of Scripture that command us, teach us, and join us, or by example, teach us to be praising the Lord. Especially, God says that the remnant people of God on the face of the earth 
are to praise him. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, you remember the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians tells about the terrible things that we all know about that are coming on the world. He said, when you know all about this, you realize the terrible things that are going to happen. What do you suppose he told us to do? And I'd read it many times. Verse 16 says, rejoice evermore. Verse 18 says, and everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I'd forgotten it all. I had been a happy man. I really enjoyed life. And now here I was down, down to the drinking the dregs. And this doctor had told people, make a list of 10 things for which you're grateful. Write it down. Say it. Put it in a sentence. Thank you, Lord, for the air. Thank you, Lord, for toothpaste, <laughs> you know. Thank you, Lord, for toothbrush. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for teeth to brush. And since then, we've been teaching people that. <laughs> but I wasn't thanking God for anything. But my medical doctor back home had been teaching people who came to him, thank the Lord, make a list. It was to follow Psalm 103 that tell us that, tells us that every sense of our being is to praise the Lord. We're to praise him by touch, writing out our praises. By sight, by looking at what we write. Praise him by speech, by saying, thank you, Lord. Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. By hearing ourselves, thank the Lord. And I remember two of my close relatives had gone to see this doctor quite a while before. And he had, he had said, you know all you need? All you need is to start praising the Lord. Make a list of 10 things for which you're grateful. The next day, 10 more. Keep thanking the Lord till you get 100 or more. I remember one of my relatives came back home after seeing that doctor. He was actually angry because the doctor hadn't given him a pill. You know why the doctor didn't give him a pill? He was a pill. <laughs> He needed to begin praising the Lord. I was a pill now, full of the dregs of self-pity. You know, if you ever decide you want to have a real thoroughbred registered nervous breakdown, start pitying yourself. It's amazing how it works. I know. I know how it worked for me. I said, Lord, I'm going to do it. And then to my utter astonishment, friends, I found I couldn't say one word of praise. And that scared me. My mind went like a cracked record. Why did this have to happen to me? Whose ox have I stolen? Whom have I murdered? Whom have I cheated? That this had to happen to me. You see, I forgot about all of the 826 texts that are praising God. I forgot all about Satan's day in court. Isn't that terrible? Why did this happen to me? I said, Lord, I can't even thank you. I said it in my mind for I could scarcely speak out loud. I said, Lord, if, you, if you'll just come to my rescue, the first thing I look at, I'll thank you for it. And I looked at the door. I said, very feebly, I said, thank you, Lord, for the door. And thank you, Lord, that it's locked so nobody can poke his head in and look at me. I'll leave it to you to decide whether that was a positive or a negative. But it was a battle. And then my mind went this cracked record. But why did this have to happen to me? What have I done that this should happen to me? Forgetful entirely of the fact that you and I are in the courtroom of the universe. We're a spectacle, spectacle to men and angels and demons. And Satan says there is no such principle as unselfishness. And the Lord said, yes. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son in utter unselfishness. And men and women who partake of the spirit of Jesus Christ are unselfish. I said, oh, Lord, please come to my rescue again. Whatever I look at, I'll thank you for it. And I looked at the window. And I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the window. And thank you, Lord, that it's locked so nobody can poke his head and look at me. <sighs> Not much progress, was it? It was a battle. My friends, when you and I get focusing on the problems of life instead of God's wonderful gift of Calvary, when we forget the agony, the humiliation of God's dear Son for you and me, we can really have nerve exhaustion or whatever we choose. I cried out, oh God, I'm not making progress. Please help me. And little by little, I got into the, into the mold of thanking the Lord and thanking the Lord and thanking the Lord. And I thanked him every waking moment for three days. In the meantime, they took me to the general hospital. 
Uh, remember, it was general. <laughs> they didn't commit me. <laughs> Three days later, I said, Lord, thank you. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he'll reap. I'm going to get up. And I'm going home. I crabbed intensely for three days. I was laid low. I have rejoiced with my whole soul for three days. I'm going to get up and go home. I remember I sat on the edge of the bed. I felt like I'd been at sea for about 30 days. Wobbly. I remember I had a pair of maroon pajamas on. <laughs> I like any color so long as it's red, you know, or near red. But I said, I don't believe I can ever negotiate taking those off and putting on my clothes. I'll, I'll dress over them. So I dressed over them, and when I was through, down below my trousers was about two inches of pajamas, <laughs> and above up here about two inches. And I thought, what will they ever think? If anybody sees me walking out of this hospital like that, they might commit me. <laughs> then I thought, well, look at all the crazy styles there. This is coon style. I said, but as I go through that hallway, I'm going to be very careful because I'm still a little wobbly. And if a doctor should come through and see me dressed like that or a nurse, I don't know what would happen. I said, I'll walk very close to the wall. If I see anybody that looks professional <laughs> come in either end of this hall, I'll just stop dead in my tracks. Because I found that doctors mind their own business. They have plenty of it to mind without minding anybody else's. You know, not a single professional person, no one came through that hall as I was making my way, wibbly-wobbly. Finally came to the door, opened the door out into the oxygen. Did you know that they tell us that nerves require five times as much oxygen as any other body tissue? And I mixed oxygen as I went down to a pay telephone. I mixed oxygen and the praise of the Lord. My friends, it's a tremendous recipe for health. Praise the Lord for the sun. Thank the Lord for the snow. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for the fog. And we don't have any more than we do, <laughs> you know. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. By the time I got to the telephone booth, I made two long-distance calls. I was glad they didn't have telephonic vision. <laughs> Walked back to the hospital, felt worlds better, praising the Lord as I went. Went into my room, changed up. My wife came, and we left for home. I said, Dear Lord, Less than a year ago, you gave me, or about a year ago, you gave me this marvelous science of prayer. We can reach right up and take the energy of God in his promises, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4. Now, Lord, I found with the claiming of promises, Satan will put us through the cross-examination. Help me from now on, Lord, to realize that I am part of the great courtroom of the universe. A witness may be cross-examined. Help me, Lord, to share this everywhere I go with Christians because I found in my ministry up to then, 25 years already in the ministry, I'd found hundreds of people who were crabbing more than they were rejoicing. They were looking at the negatives rather than the positives. I said, Lord, I want to give this to the world. Everywhere I go, I want to share it. And you know, it was quite a while before we did much. I remember later we, we were transferred to a, to a college church where there was a sanitarium. One of the church members called me one day and she said, I have to take shock treatment in three days unless I'm better. Could you help me? You know what I shared with her? I shared with her the promises of God with rejoicing. You thank God for all your worth. Because the Bible says in Psalm 22, 3, God dwells in the praises of his people. And he that has a son has life. So we're drawn very, very close to God in praising him. The whole, the whole question of sin was over whether God is just or not. Every time we crab, we're telling the devil that we're on his side, even though we don't know it. Every time we praise God for Calvary, we're telling the devil in all the legions of hell, that God is love, that God is just, that God is merciful, that God is doing what is right. Three days later, the lady sent me a message. The doctor came in and said, I don't need shock treatment. She'd had the treatment of rejoicing in Jesus Christ, Nehemiah 8.10. Oh, this is a marvelous text. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That's an equation. That's a Bible formula of life. Joy plus the Lord equals strength. 
we've been sharing with people ever since this little program. Make a list of 10 things each morning for which you're grateful, especially if you're nervous, if you're worried, if you're negative in your thinking. Thus, you employ the sense of touch. You see yourself right. Thank you, Lord, for the air. And if you're not thankful for the air, hold your breath five minutes. Ten things. Then look at it on a little card. Write it on a little card. Hold it in your hand. Sense of touch is still used. You see it. You say it. You hear it. And it tells us in the 103rd Psalm, the first five verses, if we will do that, he'll forgive every iniquity. He'll heal every disease. It says so. Every disease. It says our youth will be renewed like the eagles. I know it's true in my own life. You know what happens every once in a while? <laughs> I like it, of course. Somebody comes to me and said, uh, are you any relation to the Glenn Coon that we heard preach? I, they said, uh, about three years ago, I heard him preach. He's your father, isn't he? I said, no, he's myself. God says he will renew our youth like the eagles if we'll praise him under the cross-examination of the devil. And he tells us what will happen. Something wonderful will happen. There are at least seven things that will happen. One is our physical health will change. Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The second is our mind will change. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Proverbs 22.17. Our homes will change. Proverbs, the last chapter, says the, the man, the husband will rise and bless and praise his wife and they have a happy home. Our witness will change. Psalm 51, 12 and 13, he said, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Then will I teach transgressors your way, and sinners will be converted to you. You know, we only have to give it a second thought to know who wants a religion that makes us miserable. Come on. Can you imagine a salesman going into a big department store in town? And he says to the manager, I have something I'd like to share with you. I'd like to sell you. The merchandise that I have makes me very miserable. But I think it's your duty to buy it. Can you imagine anybody buying that? Can you expect, can I expect the non-Christian world to buy our religious product unless it makes us happy in Jesus Christ? What do you say? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Many other areas of reward in rejoicing the Lord. I think of one of the first times that I shared it, really. In St. Louis, Missouri, a lady had been in an accident. She had surgery. The surgery was successful, but left her in a state of shock. She'd gone to one <coughs> nerve specialist after another, and finally one told her, he said, we'd advise you to go to a minister. Maybe he can get through to you. Doesn't that convey a message? He probably had an answer, but she couldn't accept it. Maybe a minister of her church could get through. She came to me and said, can you help me? I said, yes, ma'am. According to Psalm 103, 1 to 5, if you praise the Lord with all that's within you, write out the things for which you're grateful. See them as you write them. Say them. Hear them. He said, he'll restore your youth like the eagle. I said, will you do it? Try it 10 days. It's a 10-day program to show us what it's like. By the end of 10 days, you have 100 things. She said, I'll do it. At the end of 10 days, that lady came to us. We we're holding a series in her church. She said, Pastor, I'm absolutely perfectly well. I said, will you write it out? The next series of meetings we held down in Winter Park, Florida. I got her letter. Brother, what a letter. She said, I went back to my nerve specialist, and he said to me, you're perfectly well. She said, I knew it, doctor. I just want to hear you tell me. He said, what did you do? She said, I did what you told me to do. What's that? I went to a minister. What did he tell you to do? He told me. <laughs> Doesn't it sound like what Elisha told Naaman? Something so simple that's laughable. He told me to make a list of 10 things <laughs> for which I was grateful and drill myself in saying them. He said, it worked, didn't it? Yes, doctor, it surely did. She said, I'm perfectly healed. When I read that letter to the people in that place, a message came through the pastor. Will you take Pastor Kuhn? over to see a 26-year-old lady who's also in a mess. Went to her home. Her eyelids were just like this. She said, for 20 years, I've lived in an imaginary room with no walls and no doors, uh, no windows and no doors. 
we gave her the same program. In eight days, in eight days, that lady was perfectly well in eight days. She said, I've gone to work. I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm babysitting. I said, how many hours a day? She said, 10. I said, you must be well. That would kill me now, sitting with little children, 10 hours, 10 hours a day. One going this way and one that way. I said, you certainly must be well. Friends, Satan demands his day in court. Let us not change our testimony. What do you say? Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, if there's one individual in this audience or back home who has been viewing the circumstances as I did and taking a wrong attitude, please forgive. You've promised to do it. Help us now to believe that you're with us even to the end. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, friends, until our next meeting, God bless you.